Com, Jetpack, amongst a bunch of other fun stuff. I work on the trust and safety team. So uh, my job has a lot of roles, but one of the things I do every day is I work in copyright takedown notices. Um, I'm not a lawyer, but I am someone who works in the trenches day in, day out. So uh, I'm happy to share some insight on the history of copyright, what to do if you get a notice, what to do if your work is copied, and uh, share some resources and some fun videos you'll see. Uh, so I'd say my interest in copyright started actually long before I worked in it. Uh, years ago, I co-founded an argan oil company. Uh, for those of you who are not familiar with argan oil, it is a nutrient-rich oil that is extracted from the fruit of the argan tree, which grows only in the southwestern soil of Morocco. Okay, so yes, I, this was my industry. So we were a little bit different in that we hand-pressed our oil. We were the only company that we knew of that hand-pressed the oil, and this was made us very special. So one day, my business partner, Joelle, wrote a post, seven warning signs that your argan oil is impure. This post went viral. I don't know why, I don't know how, but all of a sudden, our page hits started just skyrocketing. Our sales went through the roof. We were just like, we were loving it. And then all of a sudden, things started to go down. We couldn't figure it out. What is going on? So I started looking around, and I found things like this, and this and that was Facebook, and this, and this, and this was an Amazon review that somebody somebody bought another product and put this on. And the problem was is that in this, they were stating about how important it is that it's hand-pressed. And we were the company that hand-pressed it, and nobody else did. We didn't know what to do, so we were, we were very upset. Not a good time. <laughs> we started, I know, right? We started contacting the site owners. We started contacting people saying, hey, come on, come on, guys, take this down. And they just ignored us, and uh, we were kind of out of luck. Now I'm out of the industry, and now I'm like, hey, let's, let's get them. We can go back. I still talk to Joelle, like, you know, I'll help you. She's like, eh. So what is and is not copyrighted material? Simply put, copyright means the right to copy. I mean, we all know this. Copyright law prohibits others from copying specific types of work without your permission. But to qualify for copyright protection, there are a few factors that have to be met. One is it has to be fixed in a tangible medium. So what this means, it has to exist in some physical form uh, it, for any period of time. It doesn't really matter what it is, but it has to exist somewhere physical. So. Uh, this means you can be scribbled on a post-it note, it can be written on the back of an envelope, whatever. As long as it is, exists somewhere, uh, you can have copyright protection. Uh, the second one is it has to be an original work of authorship. So it must be uh, created by the author. It doesn't matter if it's similar to an existing work, or uh, it doesn't matter if it's terrible, or it's ugly, or it's, you know, it has no merit. The point is, as long as the author has created it without directly copying it, uh, the results are protected by copyright. The next one is there is a monopoly on reproduction. So with copyright protection, we give the creator a temporary monopoly on the reproduction of the work. So they have the right to determine where it's going to be published, where it's going to be put. So it belongs to them and only them. And it can't really be reproduced for a period of time. And the period of time is generally as long as they're alive. So there are some myths, definitely. Working in this industry, uh, I get a lot, of, a lot of these type of questions or concerns. So hey, you know, I don't mean to do it. I don't, I've got good intentions, so here we go. And that should be fine. So some people mistakenly think it's okay to use a work or a portion of it as long as they put some kind of disclaimer on there saying, hey, I don't, I don't mean to do this, but, you know. Uh, or they just acknowledge who took the photo. So they put, or the video, or whatever. They put the author's name on there thinking, okay, that's good enough. Uh, that's actually not true. So acknowledgement of the source material, it's, it may be a consideration in a fair use case. We're going to talk about that in a sec. But generally speaking, uh, it does not protect against a claim of infringement. So uh, you have to be careful. And when in doubt, uh, I would say contact uh, the, the permission of the copyright owner, contact the site owner. If you don't see anything there, you might you want to reach out just to make sure. Uh, the next one that we hear a lot of is that uh, I didn't register this, so I don't have any right that a copyright must be registered. 
So the owner of a creative work is actually automatically the owner of the copyright upon the production of the work. You do not need a piece of paper. Uh, to have the piece of paper to register the copyright opens up the door so that you can pursue legal action, you can go down that avenue. But if you just want to get content taken down, if you've created the content, you do not need a paper, you can go ahead and file a takedown notice. Uh, there is nothing. Hey, I found it online. It's mine. Yay, it's free. Uh, so I don't know who took this, but I like it. And since I don't see anything there, I'm just going to use it. Nobody will, nobody will mind. Uh, this is not true, as you can guess. Uh, I would say it's always best to be, again, very vigilant in those situations. Contact the site owner. Try to find out who's, uh, who owns this uh, content. Ask for permission. Um, there are definitely site owners, uh, bloggers that we find, and it's interesting that have maybe just like a little blog with like two or three photos, uh, two or three posts, and they have just some random photo that they found online. And there are people who have these photos that they've created that are just like some random photo. You wouldn't, it's not like some great creative work. Um, one example I can think of is there's a woman who creates mandala photo. You know mandala, like the design? She has these set of mandala photos. And a lot of people have just kind of taken the mandala photo because they're writing about meditation or something. And they just put it as a featured post. And this woman hunts down every instance of one of these mandala photos. I mean, she is hard at work finding these mandala photos. And she files the takedowns for these little blog owners. And they're like, I, I didn't know. And it's like, yeah, you know. So be careful. Just because you see some photo and you think it's, you know, ah, nobody's going to notice. There are people that do watch for that. The last one is this. It's mine. My name. It's my, my photo. My idea. It's all mine. So certain things do not fall under copyright. Uh, names are a big one. Uh, this includes uh, domain names. So names may be protected under trademark law, but um, that is a different WordCamp talk. So yeah, not copyrightable. Photographs. So you have to note that the subject of a photograph, if you're in the photo, doesn't necessarily mean that you own the photo. The owner of the photo is probably, most likely, the photographer, or in some cases, the person who employed the photographer to take the photo. Uh, slogans, titles, logos, short phrases, again, this may be protected under trademark, but not under copyright. Uh, the last one, and this is a good one, is the idea, uh, ideas. So copyright does not protect ideas or systems or ways of doing things. Uh, if you express the ideas in writing or drawing and you put it down on a tangible medium, that will be protected, but just having a, a concept is not copyrightable. I think about years ago, I went to this staff party and I met this uh, guy who was telling me he was all excited because he had this great idea for a book. I mean, it was going to be like the best idea or the best book ever. And I was like, what is it? And he's like, well, you have to swear, I promise that you're never going to tell anyone and you're not going to write the book. And I was like, okay, well, I'm not going to write the book. Like, just whatever, just tell me, what is it? And he told me the idea, and you know what? It's a really good idea. And I've often thought of him, like, I wonder, like, I wonder if he's ever going to write that book, uh, like 15 years later. And if I were a terrible human, I could go out and write that book, because it would do well, because it's a good story. I'm not telling you what it is, but it's good. Uh, I, could, I could write that book, and he could not come after me and say, hey, that was my idea. Copyright. Yeah, too bad. He didn't write it down. So, but I'm not a terrible human, so I can do that. So hopefully, hopefully it'll come up. So not every creative work falls under copyright protection. So there is something called fair use or fair dealing in Canada. And that's where there's a, a doctrine in the law that permits limited use of copyrighted work materials without having to get the permission from the copyright holder. So it, this is to balance the interest of the creators of the copyrighted work as well as like society as a whole. Um, this includes the exemption of fair use so that it allows copyrighted material without permission to benefit society. And you can imagine things like news reporting, parody, criticism, teaching, commentary, research, that kind of thing. So if you can imagine reviewing, uh, a, you, you're doing an academic paper and you're reviewing an author's work, you want to include excerpts of said work in your writing, that would fall under fair use. Imagine if you couldn't include any excerpts in your in your report, that would be very, uh, a very bad report, I guess you could say. So that would be considered fair use. Now fair use is a right, and it keeps copyright law from violating freedom of speech laws, which is really important. It also 
uh, if there wasn't fair use, there would essentially be kind of an unconstitutional constraint on free expression. We couldn't advance, we couldn't move forward, we couldn't use ideas to transform them to new ideas, to try new things. So how do we determine what constitutes fair use? There's four factors that we look at. The first is the purpose and the character of the use. So this is the factor that deals with the proposed use of the material, not where the material's from, not the source work, but how you're going to use it. So in evaluating the purpose and character of use, the courts will determine, and we talked about this, uh, if it has a socially beneficial purpose, like is it used for education, is it used for criticism, that kind of thing. Uh, they also look at whether the use is transformative. If it has transformed from the original source, um, we're going to discuss transformative in a moment. Uh, but the other thing they're looking at is whether or not, um, pardon me, the use is used for commercial or non-commercial purposes. So if you're using something commercially, you're profiting off something, um, it might not fall under fair use uh, as, as easily. So the second one is the nature of the work. So because facts or information that benefits the, the public is important, you have more leeway to copy from factual works than you do from like, for example, bibliographies, than you do biographies, bibliographies, from biographies than you do from fictional works like novels or plays. Because um, so, it benefits the public. So the scope of fair use is also narrower if the work is unpublished versus published. So a published work, uh, you have a little bit more leeway there. You can try to use the work uh, and it will likely fall under fair use versus an unpublished work where the author has creative control over how their work will appear publicly. So yeah, you have to be careful with that. The less you take, the less you take, the more likely uh, it will be excused as fair use as well. So obviously if you copy a whole book and put at the end, I really like that book, uh, that's not going to work. But if you take, uh, you know, little portions of it, um, it's likely to fall under fair use. However, be careful because if you're taking the, the main point of the book, the main argument, and using just that, uh, that might be a little bit tricky. Um, I was trying to think of a song as an example, and I could only think of a really old song. Um, satisfaction, song Satisfaction. Let's imagine that you take this song and you take a little rift from the song and whatever. Now let's imagine that you take the words, I ain't got no satisfaction, and that's your chorus of your song. Yes, it's just a very little bit, but that is kind of the, the crux of the whole song, so that likely would not fall under fair use. Uh, the last uh, factor that they look at is market effect. So are you, uh, are you depriving the copyright owner of income or undermining a potential market for the copyrighted work? So in my case with the argan oil, this was a big factor for us because it had a market effect. It was claiming, taking away our special thing that we were hand pressed and spreading it around. It was having a very detrimental effect on us uh, financially. So we would have been able to argue that this is not fair use because of the market effect. So let's take a quick break and, well, a little moment. We're going to look at some really cool guys from Yale Law School who were studying fair use and they came up with a really awesome song. Really cool guys. Swept the nation, but then as college kids, we made an imitation. We took the melody, yeah. used it for parody, yeah. we used it fairly. Yeah. So if you want to take some sort of legal action, what I can guarantee you'll get no satisfaction. You start assuming yeah. that you can sue me, yeah. but you can't sue me. Okay. 
you get it. So, you know, kind of fun. Uh, they're talking in there about transformative. So there are kind of two types of works, transformative versus derivative. So this is an important factor with fair use. So is the use transformative? Um, their courts are more likely to uphold a fair use case if the use transforms, uh, meaning it adds something new with a different character, expression, a meaning, a message or function. It's changing the work into transforming it into something else. This is compared to derivative, which is essentially uh, based on or derived from one or more already existing works. Examples of these uh, would be, for example, transformative, would be creating a parody of something, uh, bi uh, biographies, scholarly presentations that copy a work to provide criticism or commentary. Um, this is a pretty exact example, but placing a little size, uh, this is from a, something that we had a case on, uh, placing a little picture inside a timeline of, of a thing about a band, so like a little picture of a band poster uh, because it's transforming it. Uh, appropriation art is a big one, like Andy Warhol, you can think of like that Marilyn Monroe photo uh, that he transformed into something new. This is compared to derivative works, which are uh, examples of those would be like translations, basic translations, musical arrangements, uh, making a, a movie out of a book or a play, that kind of thing, reproductions, basically copying the book <coughs> with no transformation. So let's just look at some concrete examples. These are some examples that courts have specifically considered upholding fair use in these cases. So the first one, Google. Uh, you know, creating a database to make information searchable, that's fair use. It is, yes, it's copying verbatim exactly uh, a lot of copyrighted content in the search listings, but it's created a searchable database. It's, it's a new version of this, so that is considered fair use. Uh, the New York Times is another one. Uh, obviously reporting, quoting, reprinting to report the news, that's obviously fair use. Um, here's an example of appropriation art, uh, using old art to make uh, new art. Now this, this is a bit, like I just put this picture because it's, it's a great example, but uh, this one was a little bit weird. It was settled out of court. There was a street photographer versus the Associated Press. The Associated Press <laughs> took a series of photos in which Obama was sitting next to George Clooney. I don't know why that's relevant, but he was sitting in a, a press press re release? What is it called? Brief. Press, 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 Brief. Press, press conference. Press conference. Briefing, yeah. And uh, there was a series of photos, and this street artist, his name is Shepard Ferry, took it, transformed it, and the Associated Press was like, hey, come on. And the issue was that the street artist profited big time from that, so there was a huge market effect, like he was making coin on that, that photo. Uh, they ended up settling out of court, and now they're working together. Also, I don't know. But uh, that's a great example of a fair use case. Uh, and then, of course, The Simpsons, which is parody. I mean, it's basically copying and making fun of culture, but uh, with parody. Some other examples are things like Braille. Uh, Braille is fair use uh, when you're essentially you're copying a book, but you're making it accessible, so you're you know disabling the print. Um, or PBRs is another one. Like I think Verizon was the first company that uh, there was a court case, but you know for us maybe like Shaw or Telus, like having your PBR, it's copying material to watch later. That's fair use case. So uh, I couldn't talk about fair use without this guy. So let's just watch. <laughs> in the background. So if you can hear, uh, what is going on in this is uh, this mother, Stephanie Lenz, in 2007, posted this video on YouTube, and it's of her children running around dancing, and in the background you can faintly hear uh, Universal, well, Prince, uh, Prince's song, Let's Go Crazy. So Universal Music Group uh, filed an infringement notice to YouTube demanding that they take it down, claiming it was infringing on Prince's copyright of the song, Let's Go Crazy. Which, I mean, this is, if this isn't fair use, I don't know. I mean, this is not her infringing the copyright, it's, you know. 
Uh, so what happened was YouTube immediately took it down, and Stephanie Lenz is like, hey, you know, hold on a second here. This is my kid, so my family wants to see this. No, that's not cool. So what she ended up doing was uh, working with an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, the EFF. They are a leading nonprofit organization defending civil, civil liberties in the digital world. Say that 10 times fast. Uh, so they represented Stephanie Lenz, and they went after Universal and said, hey, uh, you can't do this. You cannot, uh, you cannot just get a video taken down without considering the fair use case. So what happened is the United States Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit ruled that copyright holders like Universal must consider fair use before trying to take down, uh, remove content from the internet. So this changed the way uh, co uh, copyright notices were issued. So from now on, or from then on, it was that the copyright holder is required to give consideration about fair use uh, before they file a claim. So what? <laughs> well, let's go back a little bit. So let's go back to 1998. Yeah. Remember 1998? <clears throat> That's what Google looked like. <clears throat> this guy, very important. I spent some time on the transitions for this slide. I just want you to know, I thought I was thinking, what would 1998 look like? <laughs> I think I nailed it. Yeah. So, uh, remember that movie? Such a movie. Yes. And who could forget these handsome fellas? <laughs> so something else happened in 1998. The DMCA, the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, established October 12th, yesterday, my husband's birthday, uh, 1998. So that's a US copyright law. It addresses the rights uh, and obligations of owners of copyrighted material who believe their rights are being violated. It also, uh, it also addresses the rights and obligations of internet service providers uh, on whose servers or networks the infringing material may be found. Um, I added this slide yesterday because <laughs> I thought it was funny. Uh, I told my team, I went on, I was like, hey, today's the DMCA's birthday and my husband's birthday. And somebody posted a picture of this. It's obviously, that's my husband. It's uh, Photoshop. And it says DMCA forever, which I thought was funny. <laughs> and I, so I posted it on Facebook last night. And I got all these comments like, wow, that's a beautiful tattoo. I'm like, <laughs> well, I, didn't, I didn't actually get the tattoo, people. Like, DMCA forever. Anyway, I thought, I thought that was important for the talk. Uh, okay, so the DMCA Copyright Act, uh, the DMCA provides a safe harbor for service providers. And so what this means is it protects service providers for being responsible for potential copyright infringement found on their service. So I work uh, with WordPress.com now. Can you imagine if we automatic were held liable for copyright on any of the WordPress, millions of WordPress blogs. Like, can you imagine? Uh, we can't control that. So we have something called Safe Harbor. Now in order to keep our Safe Harbor so that we don't get uh, notified or we don't get in trouble for having copyrighted material, uh, there are some rules that we have to follow. Um, I like to think of it it's very similar to like a bar and the liquor license, right? Uh, you know, in order to keep your liquor license for a bar, you have to follow some rules like don't give it to kids, and I don't know what the rules are, but don't give it to kids. Uh, well, it's the same for us. Or you lose your liquor license, catastrophic for a bar. For us, we would lose safe harbor, and we would be in big trouble. We open up to all sorts of lawsuits for any blog on there. Now, the rules that we have to follow uh, as rights holder are uh, there's a notice and takedown. Uh, in Canada, it's a notice and notice. So there's two different things. So Canadian law is a little bit different than American law. Um, <clears throat> so what this means, notice and takedown versus notice and notice, is that we, uh, the service provider, will receive a notice from a complainant, from you. You're upset that your work was copied. You filed a notice and sent it to us. In the US, with the notice and takedown with the DMCA, what we then have to do is take down the content notify the, the blog owner that we've taken down the content, notify the other person, the complainant that we've done that, so, and then we're good. Uh, in Canada, we don't actually, you don't actually have to take anything down, you just have to notify. So you, you notif we get the notice, notify the blog owner, and then notify the, the complainant, say, we notified, okay, we told them, like, we're out. And then it's up to the blog owner to take it from there. So, you know, the idea is that most people upon receiving a notice are going to be like, oh, 
sorry, I didn't mean to do that, I'm going to take it down uh, without too much intervention. <coughs> Um, so the notice and notice regime is the DMCA uh, for Canada and it was established January 2nd, 2015 as part of the Copyright Modernization Act of Canada. Uh, so again, the biggest difference is there's no takedown required. Now, you know, I, I'm Canadian, so I'm going to put a disclaimer here, I'm Canadian, love Canada, Canada born and raised, but most of the world follows U.S. law, so the DMCA is a little bit more, a little bit stronger. So, uh, you know, a lot of the largest service providers are based in the U.S. or have uh, some uh, operate largely out of the U.S. So, um, while this is is good to know, you are going to find, in most cases, you will be filing a DMCA takedown notice following DMCA procedures. Uh, so, this is a copy of a DMCA takedown notice for that we use for WordPress.com sites. So uh, you're going to see that there are a lot of fields. It's a big, huge notice. Um, there are language statutory requirements uh, for the DMCA. You can't just write and say, hey, this is my content, take it down, not cool, whatever. Uh, there's a bunch of stuff that you have to include in the notice in order for us to uh, be able to respond to it uh, legally. So if you if you want to uh, go through, geez, what are you doing? What do I unplug? What do I unplug? Oh, no big deal. Oh. This? Oh, oh, oh. Sorry. Well, that's awkward. Okay. Um, so, yeah, what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look online. Uh, you can find a template of this. So, if you want to file a takedown notice, you find your work has been copied. Find a template. You, I put the link uh, for ours uh, on there. Of course, if it's a WordPress.com site, you can you just use this and submit it. But uh, take a look and, and use use the language in that um, if if you need to have a takedown. So automatic.com forward slash DMCA. So let's talk briefly about uh, licenses and where to get content, how to determine what content you can or should not use without credit. So there's three kind of main licenses that you're going to look at. The first one is Creative Commons. These are free licenses. Uh, the first one is Creative Commons. This is the most common uh, free license on the internet. Uh, so people wanting to use this license can choose from a number of conditions including uh, things like is this used for commercial purposes, uh, that kind of thing. So as such, finding a photo licensed by Creative Commons doesn't necessarily mean you can use it but it's going to be clearly marked exactly how you can use it, what kind of attribution you need to give. It's gonna give you a lot of details. Uh, the GPL, uh, General Public License, it's typically a software license, but it's frequently used to license photos on the web, particularly uh, Wikipedia photos. Uh, generally speaking with this license, uh, it's free to use. You can alter an image most of the time, provided you release your work under the same terms and conditions using the same license, and you uh, mention the license. So uh, it may not be great for like large corporate blogs, but it's pretty good for most people. Uh, the last one is the public domain, and essentially this is a free for all. You can use it, you can do whatever you want. These are generally images, uh, content that is over 100 years old. You know, once, once a copyright owner dies, it does eventually go into the public domain. Um, it's also meaning any photo produced by the government. So, uh, you know, a big one is like the NASA. Any government photo you can just use. You don't have to worry about copyright. Okay, so let's talk about a few sources where you can get them. So, uh, obviously Flickr. Flickr is the largest image sharing site in the world. Great place to find photos you can use for your blog. <clears throat> when you do an image search, search you will find uh, the Any License drop-down uh, where you can select the license and uh, read up on it there. So that's, that's handy if you just want a quick photo. Um, I don't know if you know this, but Google has an image search. <laughs> I was like, yeah, obviously. Uh, what people don't know a lot of the time, though, is that you can actually search uh, by usage rights. Uh, so you go to Tools and then uh, go to Usage Rights and you can select an option there. Uh, once you filter out the images for uh, reuse, uh, there'll be like three images there and they're <laughs> terrible. But, you know, it's an option. Uh, you know, it's good to use if, if you need a quick logo or clip art or something. Nothing very artistic, but something you just need an image up there. Um, other great image sources are, uh, you know, these, these ones. Search Creative Commons, uh, Wikipedia, 
Uh, Unsplash is a really great one. A lot of artists uh, upload on there, a lot of photographers. Um, they've changed their licensing recently, so there are some attribution uh, factors that you have to look at now, but it's all very clearly marked on there. And then Pexels is another great one. And if you work with WordPress.com, uh, we actually have that now in your media library. So you just head to your media library, select free photo library, and you can search for any image you need. You don't have to worry about it. It's all in there. You can do it from the add media option also from within a poster page. So that's kind of a cool, a cool aspect. So great. We have all this information. What do I do with it? Well, the first thing you want to do is you want to think about your host. So a lot is actually up to your host. Even in the notice and takedown regime, there is still a lot that weighs on the host. So nowadays, you know, many hosts are writing transparency reports. It's kind of like, um, you know, it's a good an industry practice that a lot of people are getting into. And what that is is it shows you a yearly, um, a year, yearly data on how many takedowns they've had, how many, how much stuff has been taken down. Uh, we release our transparency report every year, uh, and a lot of people you can find this online nowadays for a lot of hosts. Um, you can look at their DMCA policy as well. So uh, some hosts, and you know, some hosts will have a, a lot of information on their takedown policy, and some you know won't. So it's kind of up to you. You might be thinking, you know, who who really cares? Like, you know, I'm not going to copy anything. Why why do I have to worry about that? Well, you know, it's interesting. Last spring, I went to RightsCon, which is a human rights conference. It was in Toronto last year, and I sat in a lot of copyright. Um, seminars, which was, I loved it, but um, <laughs> super fascinating. Anyway, uh, it was interesting because a lot of hosts there were like, hey, you know, when I get a takedown notice, as long as it, I have the requirements, as long as everything's there, I just take it down. Like, I'm not, I don't want to, I don't want to get into it, I don't know. So I just take it down. So, you know, this is something to think about. If they're taking stuff down without investigation, you know, this might be something you want to think about. The issue is, is that there are a lot of fraudulent notices being filed. There's kind of two, two, two ways that we see them. I mean, there's the classically fraudulent notice where somebody doesn't like what's published. I don't like this. It's insulting my business, so I'm going to file a notice. It's copyright. Take it down. Uh, people will go as far as to create, so I'll, I'll get a notice for, let's say, a blog. This blog has 500 posts. One post that was written five years ago has an infringing, like a, uh, sorry, a defamatory article about a company. <laughs> now I get a complaint from this guy over here who's like, hey, this guy copied my blog. This blog was published five years ago, two days before this specific post was published. This blog, five years old, only has one post, the one post that was copied, and they want it taken down. So they'll set, submit that, and it's like, you know, I don't know about you, but if I were writing a defamatory post and I was upset because a company screwed me over, do you want to keep that private or do you want to yell that from the rooftops like, hey, spread the word, this company's terrible. So it's a little bit odd when we get takedown notices for, for that saying they copied my post where I like insulted a company. So we start investigating that stuff and realize that it's a fraudulent notice. It, this person has created a blog on like Blogger or whatever. They've dated it to two days before the actual post was written, and then they've claimed copyright, copied and pasted, it and claimed copyright infringement. So without investigation, that would be taken down. The other one is bot notices. This is a big thing now. So uh, we get a lot of bot notices. I'm going to show you numbers in a sec. But with bot notices, um, what happens is an author, for example, will sign up with a service. They'll say, okay, I wrote a book. I want every mention of this book taken down because it's only sold on my site. This is exclusive to me. So they file it. They go with this company. They pay the money. And it's either by email or by takedown. And the company just uses bots. They search Google for every instance of this, uh, the book being mentioned, and then they send out the notices. And then the sites get taken down or the content gets taken down. Unfortunately, while the bot was searching Google, it also targeted the author's site. So the author's site is taken down. And they ask, what's, what the hell's going on here? Well, you know, 
So these are, these are the things that it's important that you have a host that's going to take a little bit of time to look at these issues. We, we actually, uh, we're a team of uh, six people and we look at every single notice. And that was last year. We had uh, 17,954 notices that were received. Uh, this is from our transparency report and only 20% of them had actual copyrighted material removed. Yeah? Can you clarify what host means? Oh, okay. Well, a service provider. So a host, a host is someone who's hosting websites on their platform. So, um, you know, common hosts you would see like GoDaddy or their yeah hosting files, hosting sites. If it's a custom domain, like a <coughs> domain that's owned by somebody hosted in maybe like Amazon Web Services in an instance of a server. Yeah. So anywhere where material like the the product is actually lives on the servers. So uh, anywhere like a post or a, a website lives on a server, that is the host, the person who owns that server. So the domain name is just the name that's attached to it, a little bit different, but so, you know, we're a host, uh, WordPress.com hosts websites, uh, millions of websites, so. So if I, if I own a sort of a virtual server, yeah, if I own that in Amazon Web Services, I'm the host? Uh, Amazon. 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 Yeah. They host the content. Uh, you are the. You put that content there. They'll tell you. Take it. So you want to be careful with how their policies are, because if they're going to quickly just remove stuff, um, that might be an issue. Yeah. Wait, okay. Uh, I've only got a couple minutes. Okay. So. Uh, these numbers are a little bit skewed because of bot notices, so only 20% of content was taken down. 2016, uh, that's more a more accurate representation, but still 57% of sites, um, the content, uh, sorry, 57% was only where the content was removed, uh, where some content was removed. So you can imagine 40% of those notices, like 4,000 notices, were either incomplete, fraudulent, or just incorrect. Fair use, that kind of thing. So, what if I get a takedown notice? What do we do? Okay, first thing, don't panic. Okay, so rem consider removing similar work. So if you think your work is infringing, go on there, remove it. Remove the other works that are similar to it. Because a lot of places have, a, in, in it, there's a three strikes, you may be out. There's a strike system with the DMCA. Meaning if you have multiple notices coming at you, uh, chances are your whole site's going to come down after a while. Often it's three, three times. Now not three consecutive, some people send notices five minutes after each other, but within a, a reasonable amount of time, and it varies from host to host, but uh, be careful with that. So if you get a notice, you might want to remove all content that's similar, if you think that it's uh, infringing. Uh, beware again of bots, beware of extortion, and that's where the title of this talk came because we get people like, oh my god, I put a picture up and I have to pay like ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, what do I do? And it's like, you know, don't panic, <laughs> don't hand over your visa, just take it down, you know, we'll, we'll go from there. So if you believe that it's infringing, it's not, it's not correct, you can file a counter notice, that's your legal right, and uh, that is uh, an example of our counter notice right there. Uh, you can use that as a template, uh, but that's your right, and that's saying, hey, this is a fraudulent, this is fraudulent, it's fair use, this is my content, whatever. So that is a right as a uh, site owner. Okay, what do you do if your work is copied? Like me. Okay, first of all, take a deep breath. Okay, so the first thing you want to do is check out who is hosting this.com. This is a really great uh, site, it's going to help you determine the host of the site. From there, Google the host name and DMCA. Find out what it is. Be specific. Use a form. So if they have a form there, use a form. If they don't, use our form. Find a form online. Use that language. Be specific. We get a lot of complaints where it's like, this site is infringing and it has 500 posts. And I'm like, well, which, what is infringing? So be specific. Don't waste time. And understand that your details may be published uh, publicly. Oh, I, I went too far. I went too far. Ah, okay. Oh. Don't look at that yet. Uh, understand that your details may be published. So once we receive a form, we will send it to the site owner and say, hey, this person filed a copyright claim against you. We will then put up a notice on their site. This, this item, this was removed due to copyright infringement claim by your name. So be aware of that, that your, your, uh, your information might 
be published online. And if you can, honestly, like really at the end of the day, if it's possible, I didn't put sound on this because I think there's parents in here and they're like, thank you, don't put sound on this. <laughs> I have a voice, so I don't, I don't hear this, but yeah, if you can, just like, you know, brush it off. Unless it's really hurting you, um, you know, nine times out of ten, you might just want to kind of move on from it. So, that's it. Thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry I didn't leave time for questions, so shoot me an email. Uh, I'm happy to answer. That's my username in like every service. It's very easy to get that username. <laughs>